Hey guys, welcome back to a new video by Biology with Zhang Xuan. So today, we are going to continue with chapter 10, which discusses about diseases and immunity. So this is one of the chapters, well, I wouldn't say it's not important, but maybe it's something for you to really link with common sense and also something that's relatable since it's after COVID already. So yeah, let's look at this and you know, uh, we're going to discuss every part of it of the syllabus that's been covered in this chapter step by step. So very short that there's only one subtopic which is diseases and immunity and yeah we'll look through at this immediately. So this is the learning outcome. So for learning outcomes right it's I would say it's quite important because there are some things inside the learning outcomes would be technically what the examiner wishes to see in your answers. So let's say like looking at the second which is describing transmissible disease, right? And you can see the answers actually given behind. So if you actually can uh, roughly remember this definition in your in your exam and then you put this answer, usually it is full marks because it is pretty much the keywords that is inside this syllabus that they are expecting for you in the exam. So that's why I think this is something that uh, all students should really take note is the learning outcomes. So I'm not going to look through at everything, but we're just going to go through one by one. So looking at the first, which is pathogens and its transmission. So that's pathogens means it's a disease causing organism. So you know, COVID-19 coronavirus is also known as a pathogen because this, has, this pathogen has the potential to actually cause a disease. Sometimes it can be as simple as, you know, um, a virus that can cause flu. That is also, that virus itself is also the pathogen because it can actually cause a disease. And transmissible disease, transmissible is coming from the word transmitting. It means that this pathogen or maybe this virus you can say or bacteria can be actually passed from one host to another. In this case, to be more relevant context, it will be from one person to another person. Okay. And how is actually pathogen really transmitted? It means that what are the different methods of way on how this virus or bacteria can be transmitted? Maybe it can by direct contact or it can be by indirect contact. So what does it mean by direct contact? What is it by indirect contact? Direct contact is between uh, one person to another. Maybe blood. You are dealing with blood maybe or maybe uh, body fluids. Okay, These are the things that you know once it's contaminated over each other, then there's a chance that, you know, if the person has a disease, you might have it also. Indirect can be something which is probably, you may not expect that this person may have. Let's say like food that maybe, maybe there's, uh, you know, something rotten inside the food, but you wouldn't know. But once you eat it, you got the uh, stomach ache, let's say. So that is actually an indirect contact because you actually do not know like whether this food that you're eating, it looks perfect by by in front of your eyes but then in the inside you wouldn't know whether it's actually cooked or not cooked or is it rotten or not rotten so that's indirect so these are the all dif different types of pathogens that are available in this world basically you can see we got parasites protozoas fungi prokaryotes virus and yeah prion but mainly uh well common ones that you you would know is like uh, fungi, okay, which have learned chapter one, prokaryotes, which are your bacteria and viruses. These are the three common ones that you see or pretty much in your daily life. These are the ones that usually cause a lot of the diseases that we know. So yeah, look at it. Yeah, this is probably the more uh, mm, easier in terms of picture that you can see the different ways on how it's being transmitted by touching contact with hands, uh, blood, blood stream and tissues, airborne transmission, so someone coughing, someone sneezing, can pass that trans, uh, pathogens to, from, from one person to another. Or it can be caused by contaminated water, which we actually explore with one of the bacteria that can be due to contaminated water. All right, so what are some of the body defenses that we have? So I think we should also know a little bit of like, how does our body actually defend uh, from these pathogens? And some of it, very common is like tears, eye tears that may have some enzymes inside. Your skin, which is a very important barrier that separates the outside and also the inside. You have your mucus that's lining your trachea. If we explore chapter 11, you will understand mucus is a very important uh, fluid, a uh, lubricant to help to sweep organisms away. 
stomach with the acidic pH, you know that gastric acid can actually kill bacteria. And the normal flora, which is generally the bacteria that's residing over your skin and they do not cause any harm. Okay, so how do you actually prevent the disease? It's by, of course, stopping the pathogen from spreading. So, this is uh, uh, more of a common sense, I would say, is how, what are the, some of the importance of actually controlling the disease? Like, clean water supply, uh, make sure you're preparing food very clean, personal hygiene, washing hands, uh, waste disposal, probably disposing your food into proper places, and also sewage treatment, which is more towards the environment that, you know, uh, people working in the sewage, how do they ensure that the sewage is always clean and not contaminated? So, yeah, the, basically this is very common sense, you know. Uh, don't really have to explain much, you can actually read this on your own. Okay, now let's look at an, a very important sub sub topic, I would say, which is the difference between active immunity and passive immunity. So look at this diagram, right? You can see active immunity is also subcategorized with natural and also artificial. Same thing for uh, passive immunity, natural and artificial. One of the example you can see for natural is by actually contacting with the virus or bacteria, contacting with the pathogen. Like let's, let's say you're having coronavirus, the first time you had COVID, and that is a natural active immunity because you're directly exposed to the virus. But artificial active immunity is that like you're being vaccinated, like let's say vaccinated with the influenza virus. So that is a form of artificial active immunity. But passive immunity is more of antibodies, which are just being passed in terms of like, let's say, breastfeeding, there's some antibodies that are being passed from one to another, like let's say from the mother to the baby, to give some protection. Or maybe like when you have, um, you got poisoned by venom of a snake, and how do they actually treat it? It's by giving you artificial passive immunity antibodies that actually temporarily helps to suppress the toxin, something like this, okay? So that is the difference that we are going to see. So. Active immunity is where you know the you actually the body is actually defending against the pathogen by actually producing antibodies. So we explore what is actually antibodies, what is an antigen also, and each of the pathogen will have their own antigens which have very specific shape. So this is a very very familiar term because you see this in enzymes. So what does this tell you about the antigens and the antibodies? They are also known as proteins. So whenever you see specific shapes complementary. These are the very big keywords you see in enzymes, which are a form of protein also. So let's say what is actually the difference between, you know, antigen and antibody is that, let's say this is the virus. You can see this looks like a virus actually, right? So what are all these actually pointing stuff, like this circular stuff that's attaching towards this um, virus? These are the antigens. Okay, I just put this as um, A and N, antigen. And what is actually produced by your body is this. You, can you see this Y shape? That is the antibody. And your antibody will have like an active site that actually allows the antigen to actually bind complementary, in fact, one-to-one -to -one towards this. And that becomes a antigen antibody complex. Same thing as having an enzyme substrate complex. Enzyme substrate complex is a very generalized term for anything. But one of the good examples of an enzyme substrate complex is antigen antibody complex because they have complementary shape. When I mean by complementary, it means that the shape actually fits together, not having the same shape in the antigen and the antibody. That is not possible. Okay, so that's something to recap from the chapter four. Now, antibodies they bind to antigens once again, and then they will mark pathogens for destruction by all they want to destroy. Uh, call out the phagocytes, which you have learned in chapter 9 that these are white blood cells that actually can undergo phagocytosis. So your antibodies becomes also like a signal towards these white blood cells to come and attack and kill this pathogen. So the recap of a lymphocyte versus a phagocyte. Being a phagocyte with uh, lots of, you know, segmented neutrophils, you can see they look very fragmented. And what they actually do is that they will undergo phagocytosis, meaning they actually kind of eat up the bacteria. But don't write this in the exam about eating up. The phagocytosis means they actually engulf this bacteria or this pathogen into the uh, 
cytoplasm of the white blood cell and they start to, to degrade it or deconstruct this uh, pathogen. But look at lymphocytes, right? Lymphocytes, they actually produce antibodies. So another recap here is that how are antibodies actually produced is coming from your lymphocytes. So they produce antibodies. Okay, so now looking at the mode of active immunity, right? So one of them is actually having vaccination because we know that having natural way is by going in, by being infecting towards a virus, thing that's very common sense, right? If you have COVID, that is already a natural active immunity because that's when after you recovered, you have some sort of like a protected immunity against this virus for maybe about six months. Okay, but then now let's look at vaccination, how it actually helps with the long-term immunity. So vaccination is one of the modes of active immunity, but actually why? It's because right, inside a vaccine, right, which I'm sure most of you guys, some of you may be scared, you know, that, you know, this sharp needle that they actually have, right? And what's inside this liquid or this um, suspension inside, right, it's actually mostly contain weakened pathogen or some may have dead pathogens that actually have the antigen still intact. Remember, even though they are dead, right, they are not living, it doesn't mean the antigens are gone, it's still there. So what happens is that when this um, liquid, that this suspension has been injected into the body, it, the body will recognize this as foreign because they do not know what is it. Although it's dead, it doesn't really cause anything, but the body will still be able to identify it because that is the way how we train our immune system. So the antigen will actually stimulate the, the immune response and what they do, they will ask the lymphocytes to produce antibodies. Okay, because you know, once you, the body actually exposes to this pathogen, this new person, they want to know it so that the next time when this same person comes to attack the body, they can recognize it. Then that's the that determines how fast you actually recover from the disease also. So at the same time, when you are also providing vaccination, there is also memory cells. Likewise, memory cell is to it's like an album, okay, is to recognize that okay, I've seen you before. Now the next time if I meet you six months later, I got you again, I know how to kill you faster because I have learned this before. That is the purpose of the memory cell, is to recognize these pathogens when they actually infect the body the second time. That's why it gives long-term immunity. Some may say is that like influenza virus, you may have to vaccinate every single year because the strain of the virus, which are like, it's like the variants huh, of the virus can change. And you need your body to constantly train with different types of strains. So it doesn't mean that because you are vaccinated, it's not 100% mean that you won't be getting the virus. No way. Okay? In, because there are so many types of variants of a particular pathogen. That is something to be also con concerned of. Now, looking at passive immunity, right? It is mainly short term. When I mean by short term, right, is that it's follow up. Okay, it's for a temporary purpose. Let's say a mother that's breastfeeding for, you know, for the baby. And what they do is that they pass some antibodies. And that antibodies won't be staying for years. It just stays for maybe like months like that. Just to get the baby actually immune. Because you usually babies, they won't be so young that they will go and start taking their jabs. At the beginning of the first few months after they are born, they rely on the passive immunity from the antibodies. Or maybe you may want to have um, sometimes toxins in your body it's caused by, you know, maybe something that sting you and you want to treat it. So you use uh, these passive immunity antibodies to actually help to suppress them because your bodies, usually they really do not know how to actually fight against it. And what makes it a short term is because there is actually no memory cells. So this is a very hallmark feature of passive immunity, that there is no memory cells. So this is just some extra understanding purposes of like what is a memory cell, what is an antibody, and the relationship itself. Is that basically they work its way from one side to another. There's a story to it, but I feel like what you just need to know is that plasma cell is almost like a lymphocyte, okay? Can you see the shape of the nucleus is the same as what they learn as a lymphocyte and they produce antibodies. Your memory cells, right, they will actually kind of signal the plasma cell to produce the antibodies. So that's actually the relationship of it. So a very, very good summary is this. Make sure you know that 
active versus passive immunity, what are some of the examples and whether or not it actually produces memory cell, okay? And you, in the end, you will know that active immunity is much better than passive immunity in terms of fighting all the common pathogens that we see daily. Okay, one of the very, very prominent bacterial infection, right, is actually cholera, which some of you may heard what is cholera before. And I've already mentioned in the start of my slides that there is one mode of transmission of this pathogen is through contaminated water, which is this bacteria, which is known as cholera. It's a disease that is caused by a bacterium transmitted in contaminated water, very, very dirty water. So. That is bacteria is known as Vibrio cholerae. You, you want to memorize this up to you, but it's not compulsory to. But knowing this is quite, quite good, I would say. It's not bad. It's not a bad thing. Okay, but this is very important. How does cholera causes, you know, diarrhea? Because one of the very, very key symptoms that you can see in cholera is actually diarrhea. But what, how does it actually cause a diarrhea? It's because the bacteria first releases a toxin. Once they release a toxin, they will cause chloride ion to be secreted into the small intestine. Once they go to the small intestine, what happens? The water potential drops. And when water potential drops, right, it means that using by osmosis, more water will go out of the small intestine. In the end, what happens? They move all the water out. They will start to be part of the feces or the poop and everything and they become more watery so this is something very very important you have to know because they can test this in both paper 4 and paper 2 i would say this is the most important slide you have to know because that's what they love to ask nowadays look at the past papers wise so they can cause diarrhea one thing about the diarrhea in cholera is that it's so watery and that is not good at all you will lose a lot of water in the end which is not a very good thing so essentially, you don't have to know this, just something extra is how the toxin actually will cause more sodium ion, more water to leave out from the small intestine and they will go to the um, poop, the feces and everything and they become diarrhea. So what is the treatment of cholera actually? It's usually because you lose a lot of water and also salt at the same time, right? Because salt and water, they go out at the same time. I'm not sure whether you remember from transport in plants that when wood actually absorbs, you know, your mineral ions and your water, right? It goes together almost at the same time. When mineral ions actually goes in, right? They set up the gradient, you know? So water will actually enter according to the gradient that is set up. So same thing. Now you know that water is lost, your salts are also lost. So therefore you need, what is the treatment of it? It's to replace the body with salts. So that is how simple it is because you want to make sure that your body is always enough in terms of volume because most of your body is made out of water actually. So that is why it's very important that we do not lose excessive water. So yeah, that is the end of this chapter. Do you have any questions? If you, have to do, if you do have any, make sure to comment down in the comment section below and then I will help to answer them. All right, and if that, thank you so much for listening. It's a very short chapter, but hope you get it. Bye-bye.